Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you dear colleagues, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, a very warm welcome to this uh, incredible uh, Action Indonesia webinar, where we will be giving you some incredible information about some very, very exciting species. My name is David Field. I am the CEO of Edinburgh Zoo, but the reason I'm here as your host is that I am the chair of the Committee for Population Management for the World Association of Zoos and Aquaria. I'll explain a little more in the moment. But first, a little housekeeping, if I may. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Action Indonesia website. We will speak in English, I'm afraid to say, but later we will add subtitles in Bahasa Indonesia. Questions in both languages are welcomed and will be answered at the end of the sessions. Please write your questions in the chat and we will uh, attend to those questions through the conference. So if I may begin by in, again, just introducing myself as David Field, the chair of the WASA Committee for Population Management. This committee is the one that oversees and administers the global species management plans. And we'll explain a little more about those plans in due course. So that's the reason why I'm here. But the other reason is to keep all the panelists in order. But we do have some incredible panelists here today. And I would just like to introduce you to them and ask them to wave as, they, uh, as I introduce. Firstly, we have Dr. James Burton, who is chair of the IUCN SSC Asian Wild Catalyst Specialist Group. We also have Charlotte Smith, who's the head of conservation, education and engagement at Chester Zoo and is co-leader of the education working group for Action Indonesia. We also have Marcel Aleitz, curator at the Old Veta Zoo, a very fine zoo, EEP coordinator for the Anoa and Sloth Bear, and member of the fundraising husbandry, Anoa Population Management and in situ working group of Action Indonesia. We also have Steve Metzler, who is, hi Steve, curator of mammals, very early for you, Steve, from San Diego Zoo, Banteng SSP coordinator, Chair of the Antelope, Cattle, Giraffid and Camelid Tag, co-leader of the Husbandry Working Group and Banteng Population Management Working Group for Action Indonesia. And last but by no means least, we have the wonderful Dr. Ligaya Tumbalaka, who is head of the Education and Training Division at PKBSI, the Sumatran Tiger, GSMP co-convener, and co-leader of the Husbandry Working Group and Education Working Group of Action Indonesia, uh, a remarkable panel who will give you so much information as we go forward. And our intention today is to very much give you so much more information about the species that we are working on, but also the conservation efforts, but also to inspire you and get you so excited about participating in the Action Indonesia Day 2021. We have a number of set questions, uh, which we will begin with, and I will lead those questions through uh, with the various panelists. So enough from me, you need to hear from the people who actually know what they're talking about. So I would like to begin by posing a question to James uh, to give us a real background to what is a GSMP, James, and what is the one plan approach to species conservation, which is basically the crux of this webinar? Great. Well, thanks very much, David, for the introduction um, and welcome, everybody. It's great to have so many people joining us today for this webinar to learn more about the Action Indonesia GSMP. Um, so I'll start with some background, as David said. What is the one plan approach? Well, it's, it's the development of action plans for species conservation that involves all the stakeholders that can contribute to the conservation of those species. And it also involves and takes into consideration all of those populations 
of the species in the wild and also any conservation breeding programs for those species that might be occurring in zoos. So it's a really important approach because it allows for really strong collaboration between many partners and also for those species that may need a backup population for to allow for reintroductions if a species goes extinct in the world then those those partners can all work together um, and and it really really is an effective way of working for towards species conservation for a single species and many organizations are using this one plan approach including governments and, and ngos in in planning their species conservation work and as it happens, the four species that we're talking about today that are part of the Action Indonesia GSMP, the Anoa, the Banteng, the Babarusa and the Sumatran Tiger, have all followed this same approach in their national conservation planning activities in Indonesia. So it's something that the Indonesian government has taken on as, a, as an important approach for them. So then moving on to what is a GSMP or a Global Species Management Plan? Well, this is bringing together technical experts and, and resources and, and also skills where needed to help to deliver successful conservation for a species. So this is moving into from the, from the planning phase into looking in more detail of how to bring together uh, successful conservation actions and the global species management planning uh, structure was developed by the world association of zoos and aquaria as david mentioned as a way to tackle and find solutions to complex species conservation uh, problems and, and programs and there are lots of benefits to this approach most importantly is that by um, bringing these partners together, it allows for a lot of sharing of knowledge and expertise and resources. It allows that sharing between different zoo regions. So between the different zoo regions across the world where they hold the species and are breeding them for conservation. And it also allows for sharing of skills and, and resources between the zoo community and in situ conservationists as well. So, it's, it's a really, really effective way of doing conservation. And in particular, today, what we're going to be learning more about and hearing more about is the Action Indonesia GSMPs. And as I mentioned, these are working very closely together to align the work across these four species. And they are coordinated by the Indonesian Zoo and Aquarium Association, PKBSI and also the IUCN's Asian World Cattle Specialist Group. And we're really lucky. We have about 50 partner organizations working with us to achieve these, uh, to achieve the conservation actions. And they come from Indonesia, from Europe, and also from North America. So we have great global representation. Um, and we achieve this conservation work through um, a number of thematic working groups. So you've heard the panelists are involved in a number of these different um, working groups. And these groups are people with similar skills who come together and put their efforts and energy into tackling the challenges that these species are facing. So I think I'll end there. Excellent. Thank you, James. That was a, a, a great a great summary of quite a complex and and uh, important collaboration of, of, of institutions. But it does come down to the species. And you're going to hear us talk a lot about the, the four species, the Banteng, the Barbarossa, Anoa and Sumatran tiger. So although we're, many of us will be familiar with them, why have those species been chosen? Why are those needed in conservation? So perhaps we'll start, Steve, could you talk to us a little bit about the Banteng and the Barbarossa, the, the species and the threats to their survival? Yeah, thank you, David. Um, and hi, everybody. So um, 
Yeah, these uh, these four species. So, um, you know, first, as James explained, the global species management plans. Um, we have a long history in our uh, globally in zoos uh, with these species, which gives us a lot of opportunity uh, to uh, translate that experience that we have with them in zoos um, and marry that closely with in situ conservation. So, the the I'll speak. Um, I'll start off with the bantang and the babarusa. We'll start with the bees. Um, the, uh, uh, all of these species are uh, unfortunately threatened uh, with extinction uh, due to uh, habitat loss uh, from uh, human activities uh, um, and uh, through uh, expansion of, of you know, human settlements and then also uh, through illegal activities like poaching and logging. Um, that means that their numbers are in decline uh, and the, the populations are becoming increasingly fragmented. Uh, and through that fragmentation and whatnot, um, it means that there's a lot of need for, uh, for husbandry skills like uh, rescue. Um, and, uh, um, and then in Bantang are, you know, all of these are very cool species. The uh, Bantang are an iconic species in Indonesia. Uh, so it's a, it's a really important species for them among, among others. Um, but the, uh, uh, the fact that we have these in zoos the fact that these animals are in peril um, and the, the fact that uh, all of these are such very cool species, um, they really need saving. Uh, they really need a lot of attention. And as James said, you know, bringing uh, global partners together to do this is really a, a unique uh, opportunity, uh, but also a really cool one. So, um, you know, Bantang and Babarusa are, uh, uh, they're really unique. I mean, we have, uh, um, a very strange looking pig and a very pretty looking <laughs> cow uh, um, among other things. Um, so we, we really need to protect these. We really want to see them um, around and they, they're very popular uh, in Indonesia and in our, in our zoos. So um, I'll, I'll let the others uh, go on about the other species. Thank you very much. So uh, Marcel, perhaps you'd like to uh, extol the virtues of, of a NOAA and in terms of why do they need our attention? Yeah, hello, hello, welcome together. Um, I'm happy to share some information about ANOA here. Um, yeah, as you all know, um, ANOAs are um, in two species are endemic in the island of Sulawesi, the mountain and the lowland ANOA. And with, um, yeah, uh, weighting between 150 and 300 kilograms, they are one of the smallest uh, buffaloes in the wild. and. Uh, also for for Anoa, hunting, illegal logging, and uh, loss of habitats are the greatest threats uh, for the species. Um, for less uh, than about 5,000 individuals are living in the wild now, and uh, the population is decreasing over the last decades. And that shows us how important is the um, is the secure and the safe for the species in the in the natural habitat. And also ex situ, we have all, uh, only a very small population in captivity. And um, there's also the, the problem with habitat fragmentation. And um, yeah, this um, avoid uh, that they can mix the population between uh, uh, yeah, the different uh, places. That's one of the biggest problems in whole Sulawesi or in whole Indonesia, of course. And um, yeah, with a healthy and stable population ex situ, we can have a big benefit in the in situ population. And um, yeah, this mostly uh, solitary living uh, buffalo is excellent suited uh, to pay attention of the sweating situation in Sulawesi or in whole uh, Indonesia. Also all the other species from the uh, GSMP um, is, are involved and um, have the same problematic situation in Sulawesi. Thank and you, Marcel. Indonesia, of course. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Marcel. It, incredible species. And uh, Ligaya, um, there's probably uh, the tiger is the most one of the most iconic species uh, in terms of conservation. Can you persuade us even more that it's in need of conservation? You're on mute, Ligaya. Could you please? You're still on mute. 
Sorry. Yeah. There we go. Thank you, David. Hi, everybody. James, Marcel, Steve, and everybody. Well, yeah. Even though it is a one well, iconic species, but the threat is the same like what Steve and Marcel have been told. You know, it happened also with the Sumatran tiger in Indonesia. So I think that because it is you know, one of the species from the world tiger that still exists. Yeah, I think we have to keep them. We need to conserve them. Yeah, then, uh, well, that's, uh, we've been doing this for the Sumatran tiger actually, and thank you, a lot of help also from colleagues from abroad, you know, not only from Indonesia. It started 1992 actually, and then the SMP for Sumatran tiger actually earlier. Uh, but I'm glad that after that, James come with the Ungulate DSMP. So uh, I'm not alone now. Uh, there are uh, uh, different species also that are uh, what manage. So yes, we still, we really need to help the species uh, for Sumatran tiger because of all those threats that we have. Even though I know that several of them are also in the zoo outside of Indonesia. I'm glad that we are still there. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Ligaya, and that's great. Because now you, you talk about the, the animals that are in the zoos. So actually, if I can turn back briefly to the three of you, um, perhaps starting with you, Steve, how does the ex situ conservation and breeding uh, support the in situ populations or conservation efforts? Could you perhaps tell us something about husbandry guidelines and skill sharing? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, having, having a long history with these species uh, worldwide in our zoos uh, gives us a lot of information, um, a, lot of, a lot of history, and a lot of uh, potential connections to in situ conservation. So uh, we have access to these animals uh, in our facilities, unlike you know, we can when in studying them in the wild. Obviously that you know, in wild habitat, it poses a lot of challenges, and um, and that's all important information for us to you know to conserve them. Um, but there's a lot of things that we can't quite do is is have the direct access to those animals. So, you know, just things like uh, you know uh, testing out radio collars uh, on our animals in our zoological facilities is uh, is a great opportunity to make sure that they're that they're safe, that they're functioning in the way that they should. Um, and because we can have that direct access to those animals before we ever then, you know, go into wild habitat and, uh, and get our hands on an animal there. Well, of course, these animals are, uh, are already in danger of extinction. We don't want things to go wrong uh, in situ. So we can do all of that testing in the controlled environment in our institutions. Um, also, as we, as we look at the need for, you know, captive breeding centers, or infusing new genetics or, or things like that, you know, good husbandry is what's really very important. So uh, we, we learn a lot about the, you know, the social dynamics, uh, the, the nutritional needs, the, uh, um, you know, veterinary medicine. If we're going to radio collar uh, an animal in wild habitat, uh, we're obviously going to need to get our hands on it, and that's going to require veterinary intervention, uh, anesthetic techniques. Well, these are all things that we've been perfecting in our zoos for years. Um, then, then we have you know a wide range of experts for all the different things that you might need for uh, in situ conservation. So, um, just by uh, us having access and long history with these animals, being able to observe them closely uh, in a in a more controlled environment. Uh, we, we learn a lot that, that translates directly to um, conservation. I have to say when I, you know, I've been in the zoo field for a few decades now. And uh, when I first started, I thought, uh, how can I really contribute to conservation when I'm working in a zoological facility? And I felt less of a connection back then than I do now. And it's because with all these fragmented populations, more and more, uh, it's all a level of human management for, for wildlife, whether it be um, in situ or ex situ, and it's just kind of a continuum. And so with, uh, with us being able to, uh, you know, to manage these animals in, in human care, uh, I'm finding more and more connection. I'm finding that my expertise and the expertise of my colleagues here um, all 
really play a, a strong part into in situ conservation now because it's become meta population management, uh, you know, getting our hands on animals, uh, rescuing animals. And these are all things that we've, we've learned to do in our, our zoological facilities. So I think that we can all work uh, really well together. And then I would just add the one other part of this is, you know, we have lots of guests that visit our zoological facilities. Um, we, in, in some cases, can get, you know, a, a nice uh, attention on, on these species. And with that attention often comes conservation dollars, uh, either from our guests or from our institutions. So I think that's another big benefit of, uh, of zoological uh, institutions and organizations being, being part of, of conservation. Absolutely, thank you. Um, perhaps I could just ask uh, Marcel, do you want to add anything around sort of the genetics breedings uh, aside to the, the support that the, uh, the XC2 population provides? Yes, yeah, Steve mentions uh, a lot uh, why uh, XC2 population is so important also for the in situ population. Also with the genetic situation, the, the first important thing with the ex situ population is to know exactly the genetics of all individuals uh, we have in the population from the different species. Uh, for example, in the EP population for NOAA, we have in total 44 animals and 20 institutions. Uh, right now, that's a really small population. And in total, in the ESB population, we have around 190 NOAs in uh, more than 40 facilities. That shows how important it is to know exactly the genetic situation in the population to, um, to have or to obtain a healthy population for the next decades uh, and also to, to find the right individuals to breed with. Um, and in a small population or also in a big population, that is one of the important things to avoid the bottleneck effect. Um, and for that uh, goal, is a, it's necessary that all participants cooperate uh, with each other, that we can make uh, important uh, transfers without any problems. So normally all participants agree with the transfer recommendation because it's very important to, to breed with the different animals in different um, facilities, not only in one. And um, yeah, for the knowledge for breeding them could help us also uh, in situ uh, to, to um, improve the, the population there with, uh, with a successful breeding uh, without losing animals uh, due to the breeding. And um, also it shows us and help us to understand and find out how the situation genetically is, um, is in, the, in the wild. And um, also that should be our future goal that we find the suitable animals uh, to, to bring into the in situ population, but that's one of the biggest goals from mostly all GSMPs. But uh, for to do it, uh, it's necessary to to find uh, the right habitat, the the right animals, and of course you need uh, first safe places uh, for breeding and releasing animals. And that right. um, knowledge from ex situ helps us also in in situ yeah. again. So. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Um, I'm going to move on a little bit and change tack slightly away from the species, but more into to humans, uh, if I may, and bring in, uh, bring in Charlotte. Um, the education and public and awareness work that's done through zoos uh, is crucial about raising awareness and changing behaviour. What's kind of the, the impact and the importance for that for these species? It's really important um, for these species, slightly different for the different species. So I think with Anoa, Barbarisa and Banteng, we recognise that although quite a lot of collections might have them, they're not often focusing their education programmes on them. They may be sometimes perceived as less interesting as something iconic or that's seen as very conservation iconic, like the Sumatran tiger. Um, which does desperately need our help. So still really important as a focus for education and awareness raising. But with the, those other species fostering that love, and I think Steve alluded to earlier, that support sometimes financially or in terms of our actions for conservation of those species is really important. 
So what we do is an education working group working across all of the regions, so bringing together experts from across North America, from Europe and from Indonesia, having looking at shared messaging, but also adapting it for each region and then creating resources that you can find on our website, um, which will be given at the end of this webinar. So resources so that every collection doesn't have to reinvent the wheel when they're looking for educational activities or ways to raise awareness or resources or good imagery. It's all there on the website for people to download and sharing that as widely as we can through social media and presentations and training to really make sure we've got a joined up approach to how we message about the species and how we can come together to really raise awareness and focus that these species are really in need of our conservation support. Um, and we have plans in the future to also look at that join up between how we share that in situ as well and how we work directly where there might be more direct threats to the conservation of those species. Because um, without changing human behaviours, obviously, there won't be safe spaces to release them to um, if we get to that point in the future. So those two things really do need to go hand in hand. All right, superb, uh, absolutely. And therefore this whole education and indeed husbandry capacity building for the GSMPs is, is, is hugely, hugely important. But why, and Charlotte and Ligaya, I'm gonna to come to you, to you both, perhaps Charlotte, you first. Why is that capacity building training that the GSMP runs so important? I think with education, it goes back to a little to what we were saying about that kind of shared messaging and speaking with one voice and that consistency. But one of the great things about a GSMP and having experts from all across the world is being able to come together and share those skills with each other, to learn from each other. And particularly in the case of education, I think this is true for husbands as well, creating best practice guidelines together so they can be shared. So each institution isn't having to start from scratch and think, well, what do we do? So, well, actually, we've got resources we can share and we can show you through training how to use them. And we can all be more efficient and do more for these species together. That Ligaya might have more to add around husbandry training as well. Please, Ligaya. Yeah. Well, for me, I mean, like this is really important, and I'm really thanks that with this collaboration, you know, we have a lot of things that we can learn. Uh, and then I think that it is important the education, not only the content of whatever that like resources that Charlotte uh, give, but also it is important that there are people who can uh, give those information correctly to other people. People like in the zoo, for instance, as a zoo educator, they need to uh, give uh, good information to the visitor and on the way that really make people will, yeah, now we learn how to ask, ask people to change, yeah, Charlotte, how the way th they, they think about wildlife so they can really, because in Indonesia, we have the saying, if you don't know them, you, you cannot love them, you know, like tak kenal maka tak sayang, that's what they call. So with, you know, giving information more to the, yeah, not only Indonesian, but all, also with the people outside the Indonesian, well, thank you that they will love Indonesian wild animal and helping to conserve them as well. So it's important, Dave. Fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> so, I mean, we talk about that whole importance of the, the that, that capacity building in relation to zoo educators and educators, but equally, and, and Steve, I'm gonna to come to you a little bit more, although you've already touched on it a little bit in terms of the training and capacity building that's been done in the areas of husbandry. Yeah, so this is uh, from very early on with uh, the Action Indonesia group, as we were uh, working uh, with our colleagues in Indonesia, it was, you know, what, what should we be focusing on uh, you know, what is it that, that everyone, everybody needs and is looking for and, uh, and husbandry uh, expertise is definitely a big one. So uh, that is an area that we've absolutely focused on was, uh, you know, sharing of information as we talked about, we're caring for these species worldwide. So there's a lot of knowledge out there, but it's bringing it all together. Uh, this group has been really active in that and, uh, and a lot of great work has been done in the the five or six years that this group's been been together. Uh, zoo visits 
is a is a really important one. Is is uh, um, through the years, and, and again, even in the in early 2020, uh, a number of, of individuals of this group have gone to these uh, different zoos to uh, uh, you know advise on their programs, really understand uh, any of their challenges, find out what sort of information they're looking for. Uh, and then bring that back to the group where if it couldn't be provided directly on site that we could, you know, gather those resources for them. And then, of course, we had the, um, the, the pandemic hit last year, which for, you know, conservation efforts and certainly the efforts of this group worldwide uh, really made us all reevaluate and take a step back and figure out what we needed to do next. Um, and the uh, Action Indonesia group, uh, as well as uh, uh, PKBSI's um, education group uh, actually, uh, you know, went into a webinar series, which was wonderful. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that the learnings from that, that webinar series is something that's going to even go on, you know, after we get past all of the, this pandemic. Um, there was a bunch of different topics that were uh, presented on that, including uh, a husbandry, exhibit design, record keeping, enrichment, nutrition, among others. Uh, so, I mean, this group has been really active um, and, you know, I'm a small part of that, but I, I every time I hear uh, what, what everybody in this group has been working on and, and uh, to help out with the husbandry skills and the, the meetings that are set up, it's, it's very, very impressive. And all of that, of course, leads to happy, healthy animals um, and happy, healthy animals then uh, also then have healthy breeding groups. And you know that's where we tie it all back into the conservation efforts is by having you know healthy XC2 populations. Uh, those are assurance populations for the um, the wild. Um, and then we also you know that's important genetics that we can uh, we have for for the future to make sure that our populations are healthy. So I think it all starts with husbandry, and uh, and then we we can you know help save these species. Absolutely. And, you know, what's coming out from me from all of these talks is there's so many, there's so many different angles, there's so many different parts to this jigsaw of Action Indonesia that's leading to the, the sort of successful conservation and the successful projects. Now, I'm getting so many, I've got so many questions myself, but this, we really want all of you out there to provide questions to these incredible panelists. Now's your chance to start firing in some of those questions please put them into the chat and we'll make sure we've got time to cover these questions towards the end. So please don't be shy and you don't want me talking and asking my, my silly questions all the time. But look, we, we touched on some of the exciting stuff that the GSMP and this Action Indonesia is pushing through towards uh, protecting these species in situ. And there's lots we could choose from, but perhaps Marcel, could you talk a little bit about the work that's being done to support forestry offices in Sulawesi? Yes, um, yeah, we talked a lot about uh, direct husbandry, husbandry with, uh, with the animals on site. And uh, yeah, the Zoo Leipzig and the um, Zoo Münster worked together in a fantastic project in, in Manado, Sulawesi, in the Anoa Breeding Center over there. We went there two times um, and worked directly on site with the staff. And uh, we share our knowledge uh, with, uh, yeah, um, take care of uh, Anoas. We, we start uh, with a diet. We, we establish uh, new constructions in the enclosures. And um, there were already a successful breeding with Anoas on site. And uh, that's one of the important points of the GSMP to work together worldwide to share our knowledge and uh, to help each other uh, to, to find the best way to, to keep the animals and uh, to take the best care of them. And that was really impressive how the team of the ABC was working for the goal to, to find the best uh, best husbandry and breeding possibilities uh, for the animals. And that was a fantastic um, situation also for the Zoo Leipzig and uh, Zoo Münster to, to work with a really nice team on site. And that was a good example uh, from the GSMP to work directly with participants uh, worldwide. And I hopefully we can continue the work and um, yeah, that we find more possibilities to support each other. 
Fantastic. Thanks, Marcel. Um, actually, would like to. There's, a, there's another fantastic project I'd like to touch on. Uh, and James, could you talk a little bit about the Bantang population monitoring? Yeah. So uh, jumping islands to Java within Indonesia, um, there are four reasonably uh, large Bantang populations in, in Java, though most of them are, are all in decline. And so we recognize it's really important to have a good understanding of the population size um, of those groups of Bantang. So in Alice Puro National Park in East Java, we are working very closely with the National Park um, to improve and develop their camera trapping study of their Bantang population, which they have been doing for a number of years. So we're bringing in expertise to improve the design and also extra resources to expand so that we can do a complete park-wide camera trapping study. Um, and we've done a, a little bit of preliminary training relating to that now. And we're actually gonna be putting the camera traps out within the next month. So that's gonna be a, a really important step um, to building links with other national parks and helping to to build capacity across Java in those four parks and eventually, uh, hopefully develop what will be uh, coordinated management across the four parks and have much more of a meta population where we're coordinating and managing those populations more effectively as one group. Excellent. Thank you, James. Steve, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I would just add that, uh, you know, I'm excited that we're getting to, uh, you know, to expand that that camp, those camera trapping and what we understand of the populations there and, and the activity of those animals. You know, I, I just will say uh, this is another, you know, collaboration with with our zoos. We actually got an, uh, an American Zoo and Aquarium Association conservation grant fund uh, to be able to purchase uh, more of those cameras uh, and to help with that project. So. Uh, I'm really, I'm really proud of you know those those collaborations, um, and I've I've been fortunate enough to visit the the three uh, national parks in in East Java, and um, I'm very excited to to learn more about the the Bantang. And um, we've been talking about this project for a few years, and I, I'm really excited to see the the results of these coming out in the in the coming years. That's that's superb. Well, thanks for all the questions that have come in. Really, really grateful for that. Um, but we come to a real crux now. And Karen Bauman, you've asked how we can get more involved. Well, this is your chance now, because Charlotte, can you tell us now about Action Indonesia Day and how people can get involved? Yes, so Action Indonesia Day is on the 15th of August this year. This is actually our third year. We started in 2019 and over the last few years, um, around 50 organizations have been involved, running activities in their zoos, raising awareness of these species, really trying to generate that conservation support for them. But even if you're not part of, a, if you are part of a collection, it would be great, talk to your education and your social marketing teams about sharing content on social media, running activities. There's lots of ideas for how you can do that on the website, actionindonesia.org. But even as individuals, there's something we can all do. Um, the institutions, the members of this all of our partnership will be sharing content on social media with the hashtag Action Indonesia Day. And you can reshare those, add your comments, so we can really generate a buzz and that support for conservation of these species that quite often people may not have thought about as being in conservation need. Not often that people look at cows and pigs and think of actually these are species that do really need our help and we can all use this day to shine a light on that um, so hopefully I've just seen there's sort of 85 of us on this call so hopefully that's at least 85 important shares for this um, but yeah it's something that we can all do to raise awareness of these species and I would encourage you to go to the website or drop us a line on the email address that's now been shown on the screen if you're interested in getting involved. Fantastic. It really is incredibly exciting. I've got to know more about this as I got involved with this, this webinar and it really, really is exciting stuff and, and has the potential to be fantastic and really impactful. But it is all about the future as well. 
And James, uh, I'd like to turn to you a little bit around, you know, we're doing all of this work, but what are the future plans and targets? And a, and a couple of questions that have come in, which you might be able to address at the same time, is what does success for GSMPs look like in 10 years' time? And um, uh, Sabrina has also asked, is how long does the GSMP run for? What are the sustainability plans? Perhaps if you could address those at the same time, that'd be great. Yeah, great questions. Thank you. Um, well, it's saving species is obviously a very long term uh, job. We all know that we're all doing it, and it and we appreciate that it's it does take a long time and a huge amount of effort. The way that the Action Indonesia partnership works is that we run uh, plan we, we plan for a two to three year period so we're actually coming up in the start of next year to, to, to have a, a further three-year planning phase um, and those are where ideally we all come together and we all are able to put our ideas together and develop that next three-year plan so that is a kind of short mid-term planning um, cycle so I'm excited that we're going to be at least getting together virtually at the start of next year if not face to face but it'll be great to see lots of friends and colleagues at, at that gathering and we're going to have some really exciting new projects and new developments coming from that um, we've already completed two of these cycles uh, and it's always inspiring to 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 develop a further phase on on the question of the time scale and the, the longer term vision of the action indonesia partnership we set out recognizing um, when when we combined the four um, species gsmps together in about 2016 we realized that we were going to be working on this for at least 10 years and i think there is still huge huge amounts of work to do that the this partnership can still continue to do for the coming 10 years uh, we have some very clear goals and targets. So, for example, and, and we touched on this when talking about population management side and the breeding aspect, uh, we have set a target to build the ex situ population of the ungulate species, and it could be the same for the Sumatran tiger, to 300 animals uh, in those ex situ populations, which will give us our secure and genetically diverse populations that we need and we're and our first phase of really building that is to increase the size of the population and the genetic diversity within the indonesia population and we have made some great progress i think we've had 30 births in the last few years um, and we need to across the the four species and we need to continue to move towards reaching that, that target of 100 of those animals per, uh, per species within Indonesia. So I can see that taking us five years minimum. Um, and of course, the in-situ component and all the capacity building needs to be refreshed, needs to be renewed. We need to be continuing to work on that. So does that answer the, the timescale questions um, in not too much detail? Um, and we've got lots of yeah, lots of activities that we're continuing to to work on. We we want to expand the in situ work within East Java, but also start to do some population monitoring and uh, expand the education work and, and other activities within Sulawesi as well. So, lots more to come. That's fantastic. Um, you know, I mean, we talked about that, I, I, Charlotte. We've we've said how important the education side of this is to too. What about the future plans for education? And actually, could you also mention about where we can find these resources? Karen Chin was asking because clearly impressed. So where can we find all these resources? So all the resources that we've made are available on the website. Uh, if you go to the website, there is a bar across the top. One of them says resources on it. If you click there, it takes you it appears almost like a web shop, but there's no cost. They're all free to download. And you literally just click on the resources that you're interested in and you can download them from there. 
And the thing I would say is keep checking back because we're quite a small working group, but we do aim to keep adding resources. We'll be adding more in the lead up to Action Indonesia Day. So do check back for new resources there. In terms of the future for us, um, since we first began as a group, which was actually only two or three years ago now, we obviously launched Action Indonesia Day, created the website and the resources, but we're really keen now over the next couple of years to continue working with zoo audiences and tightening that messaging, getting the messaging out about the species, but to begin to collaborate more broadly as well, um, working more with our in situ partners, building on the work that the GSMP is already doing in situ to look at how we can use education and community engagement to directly mitigate some of those threats that Steve and Marcel were talking about earlier that these species are facing. So that's really our direction of travel is beginning to broaden our network um, and reach more organizations who are working to um, conserve these species so that we can join up on education work. Brilliant, fantastic. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna to turn to a few more of the, the, the other questions now, and there's some uh, really interesting ones there. I'm going to turn first to, to Mike Barnes from Zoo Miami, who says that Zoo Miami houses all four of the species. What can we do here to help husbandry there? Great question. Are there specific areas we can focus on or information that we can collect in the zoos from the animals we are working with here? Uh, Marcel, Steve, could you, could you take that answer, please? Steve. Yeah, um, oh. maybe I start, uh, Steve. Uh, um, yeah, I think um, a lot of data collection is uh, really helpful for all of us. If you have some information about your diets, about your handling or and restrain of the animals, and also um, transport crates are very helpful to get more details and also how you educate uh, the people. Uh, uh, with the uh, four species in your zoo can also help for, help us to uh, to combine it uh, to uh, to Sulawesi or uh, in total Indonesia. Super, Steve. Yeah, uh, hey Mike. Um, so I, I think that uh, one of the most important things you could do is is uh, you know collecting those best practices that you're already doing at your institution. Um, as we talked about, we we've been doing uh, we were doing uh, in person. Uh, you know, husbandry sharing, um, you know, seminars uh, and interactive uh, uh, meetings uh, with the webinars have been going on uh, this last year. What we really need is uh, presenters and information. So, you know, any if you get video of good husbandry practices that we can share uh, with colleagues that that's wonderful, you know, protocols, uh, you know, any any sort of, you know, pictures or, or any material. Um, is we're always really anxious for uh, volunteers to, to help us with these presentations, uh, with putting together husbandry guidelines um, and, and best practices. So um, even just, just doing a really good job of documenting what you do at your facility, sharing it with the group. And uh, if you have uh, yourself or folks at your institution that are, are excited to, to do that in, in webinars or things like that, that that's really a, a great way you can help. That's fantastic. Okay, uh, next question, and I'm going to put this one over to you, Ligaya. Uh, we have a great question from Sarah. How can institutions in neighboring countries to Indonesia contribute to this program? Okay. <laughs> well, for this program, actually, the SMP also collaborate with the PKBSI. So if one want to join it, if want to go directly to Indonesia, yeah, talk to the Sioux Association, Sarah. I think we will give the information for that. And then James also will help for you. I think that's the way we have to do it. And, and get involved in Action Indonesia Day. Oh yeah. Yeah, please <laughs> to do it without, yeah. That's the direct uh, way that we can collaborate now. <laughs> That's brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. Okay, um, we still got time for a few more questions. So uh, I'm gonna look for a question from Morwena Hope, who is currently a science intern at Chester Zoo, working in their wildlife endo endocrinology lab. Uh, with regards to Asian cattle species, 
we've been starting to analyze fecal samples as well as having analyzed samples in Bangtan cows for progesterone monitoring and more recently testosterone in our bull. Is wildlife endocrinology for in situ populations using non-invasive fecal samples a potential future conservation tool? Dr. Burton. I think the answer is yes. Oh, expand, yeah. please. <laughs> the, the challenge, I guess the, the, the beauty of, of being able to collect material information from, from dung is that it's not invasive. So always the challenge with working with these species is that your um, your you getting information from them is super difficult. Um, so having the ability to collect information on um, on reproduction cycles is is going to be really really valuable. Um, we we don't we we really know very little about the the breeding um, in the wild. So. I think what would what would be fantastic and, and how that potentially impacts conservation as well. So I think um, having some um, better understanding of what the, the challenges of, about breeding might be that might you know, impact and possibly reduce the population growth in the wild would be really, really helpful. And and where there are stresses on on these animals because of we, we think that, that drought may be an issue. Um, maybe potentially insufficient food sources may be a challenge. So all of these things may impact on the breeding success. And so understanding that in the different habitats uh, in Indonesia would be really, really valuable. So yeah, great suggestion. Let's talk more about it. Fantastic. Uh, there's a question that's just come in from Simon, uh, Simon Persa. But first I'd say welcome to our wildlife vets in Sulawesi. Who are watching this webinar. Um, Marcel, are there ANOA husbandry manuals published? Uh, not yet, not in total. We uh, develop um, guidelines for the ABC Manado um, for our work there, but there were really a draft and short version. Uh, and we're working on uh, practice guidelines uh, in the EP already, but um, I'm not sure when we will finish them. Um, but that would be a great tool and is very helpful for all holders worldwide to have these guidelines and they are really important. And I hope uh, Simon give us uh, the knowledge uh, from himself uh, for the guidelines because I know Simon is really <laughs> express in, um, in handling ANOAS. So no, we, we don't have them yet. But Simon's committing to writing the, uh, the, the restraint chapter then for you. <laughs> of course. Very good. Thank you, Simon. Uh, a question from Dan, which could be interesting about, are there any plans to expand upon additional species uh, within Action Indonesia? Uh, perhaps, James, you might want to make, talk to that. Yeah, I can comment on that, but others might want to as well. Um, maybe Ligaya. Um, yes, we initially... The, the three ungulate species and the Samarchan tiger all came together because there were all national action plans and there were strong zoo populations that we had the opportunity to work with. Um, so we, we've, we started with the four taxa that we're working with, thinking that would be quite a big challenge anyway. And we've been amazed at the progress that we have been able to make with those. So it is definitely a possibility that including other species that have the need for this ex situ population management to be added or to follow a similar uh, type structure to the GSMPs. Um, and I know it's, yeah, Orangutan um, and Komodo Dragon are, are two candidates. Um, I guess my only note of caution is that we want to make sure that this is running really, really effectively. And the more species we bring in, then the, the more um, partners, the more challenges there may be. It seems to work really well with three ungulate species and the friendly Samarchan tiger. So yeah, I would like to, uh, and definitely we can, we can start the initial discussions and, and find a suitable time to include or work in parallel with other species, yeah. And, and to say that 
already through the work that we're we're engaged with, hopefully there are lots of benefits through staff training and, and seeing the GSMP as a model that are actually already rolling out to other species in Indonesian zoos and, and more widely anyway. But yeah, great question and good suggestion. And I see we have a fan for Thomas Stomer as well. Yep. To add to the list. Okay. Well, thank you all for your questions. Um, Angelica Reed also asked about how she could join potential conservation research efforts. Um, well, Angelica, being part of Action Indonesia and Action Indonesia Day is a perfect start to this. Um, if you drop us drop us a line on our on our on the Action Indonesia email, we'll be able to tell you a little bit more in answer to your question. But I think probably at this point I need to just draw a close to the questions. Thank you all for this information. Uh, I think it's been an incredible uh, webinar. Um, I really very much appreciate all the uh, interaction from people. Um, I want to remind you about uh, what this was all about, not just the species, but very much Action Indonesia Day, 15th of August, 2021. There's no football on. There's uh, are the Olympics finished? Not sure. But this will should take pre precedence in all of your diaries. It's incredibly exciting. And you've seen the most in, amazing work that's been talked about by our remarkable panelists. And thank you to, to James, Ligaya, Steve, Marcel. Uh, it, it's, it's great work that's being done. Thank you for all your wisdom. Thank you for all your knowledge. Thank you for Charlotte for your education work and for you. Uh, I'm putting all of this together. Thank you for all the, the tech people in the background who've been helping me out. Um, we've got an exciting opportunity here to conserve, protect these amazing species. And the collaboration, the international collaboration that comes together through these GSMPs and through the One Plan approach is, is incredible, inspiring, and we just need to do more of it, because the more conservation we do, the better it gets. Thank you all for your participation. Action Indonesia uh, Day, 15th of August. All the information you need is there. Thank you all, and goodbye. <laughs>